Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to discuss is the intersection of two subgroups. Okay, and what we're going to see is that if you intersect two subgroups, then the intersection of the two subgroups is actually another subgroup. Okay, so the intersection of two subgroups is another subgroup, and this is actually a very, very important fact that is used in the proof of many theorems later on in group theory. Okay, now just before we actually begin our discussion of the intersection of two subgroups, what I want to talk about firstly is something that I really should have talked about in the previous video when we introduced the concept of a subgroup and that is the strict notation for a subgroup because the notation that I gave you is strictly incorrect, okay? It's very almost correct, but it's strictly speaking incorrect. It's an incorrection that people often make uh, and which they use casually and the meaning is still understood, uh, but strictly speaking it is still incorrect. So what I want to firstly do at the start of this video is just uh, talk about the strict notation for a subgroup, okay, and then we'll move on to the intersection of two subgroups. Okay, so, in the previous video then, we defined what it means for a subset of a group to actually be a subgroup, okay, so we discussed what it means for a subset, capital H, of the group, capital G, to actually be a subgroup. And we saw that in order to be a subgroup, it has to be the case that this subset with the inherited composition law defined on it actually is a group in its own right. Okay, so it obeys the axioms of group theory, so it needs to be closed, it needs to be associative, it needs to have the identity element in, and it needs to have inverses in. Okay, now the thing that I want to make, the comment that I want to make, is that in the previous video I said that the way that you denote capital H being a subgroup of capital G is like so. You write less than, okay? Strictly speaking, what that means is not capital H is a subgroup of capital G, but it means capital H is a proper subgroup, okay? So strictly speaking, this means is a proper subgroup. Okay, strictly speaking, the way that you would denote that capital H is just a subgroup of capital G is you'd write capital H is less than or equal to capital G. Okay, that is the way that you denote capital H as a subgroup of capital G. Okay, and this equals bit here denotes the fact that actually capital H could be the subgroup that is the entire group. Whereas if you don't put the equals bit, if you just put H is less than, that means that it's a proper subgroup, okay? It is not the subgroup that is the entire group, basically. It is properly contained within capital G. This is exactly the same sort of notational difference as when we're talking about just two sets. So if we say that H is contained within G, like so. This means that H is properly contained within G. It's a proper subset of capital G. It's not the entire set, basically. Okay, if we wanted to say that it's just a subset of capital G, this is the notation for subset. Okay, so this means H is a subset of G. It could be the entire set itself, basically. It's not necessarily a proper subset. Okay, similarly, H is less than or equal to G just means that it's a subgroup, basically. It could end up being the entire group, or it could not be. But this is stronger, basically. This says, no, it's not the entire group, or it's not the entire set in this case. Okay, so this is proper subset. Okay, right, so in the previous video I just said that this meant that it's a subgroup, and people often do just use this to mean subgroup, but strictly speaking the way that you should do it is you should put H is less than or equal to G unless you know that H actually is a proper subgroup. Okay, right, so that's first the, uh, the nomenclature bit, okay? What we will now go on to is the actual topic of this video, which is the intersection of two subgroups. Okay, so what I want to consider then is what the case where we have two subgroups. So let's say we have capital H1 and capital H2, 
which are both subgroups of our group capital G. Okay, what I want to show you in this video is that if I intersect those two uh, subgroups together, so H1 intersect H2, that this is also a subgroup of capital G. So this is the great thing then that I want to show you in this video, to show that H1 intersect H2 is also a subgroup. And I've made the exact mistake that I've just warned you about. Okay, I apologise for that. I, I told you I, I, I'm awful for this. Okay, so uh, strictly speaking, I should put is less than or equal to to denote subgroup. So H1 and H2 are subgroups of capital G, not necessarily proper subgroups. I want to now show that H1 intersect H2 is a subgroup of G, and again, not necessarily a proper subgroup. It doesn't need to be the case that they are proper subgroups. Okay, right, so let's draw a picture to denote what this actually means, okay? So firstly, let's have a box to represent our entire group. So this box here, this is going to represent our entire group, and I think I will use the colour yellow for our entire group here. So here is the entire group, okay? Uh, and now let's put on both subgroups. So we'll have firstly here capital H1, okay? And once again, I'll colour code it. So we'll have capital H1, which is one of these special subsets that happens to be a subgroup with the inherited composition law from the larger group on it. Okay, then I'll have another subgroup here, which can be capital H2. Okay, and I will colour capital H2 here in in turquoise. Okay. And what you can see here is that they do in fact have an intersection, and indeed subgroups will always have an, an intersection, a non-empty intersection. And the reason is that both of them have to contain the identity. In order to be subgroups, they have to contain the identity element. So at the very least, what will be in their intersection is the identity element. So they always have a non-empty intersection, basically. Oops, that's smudged horribly. So this is the intersection H1 intersect H2. Okay, and just to rigorously define this, this is all the elements of um, the subgroups H1 and H2 that are in both of them. Okay, so this is elements of the group capital G, which are elements of both H1 and H2. So I'll write it out. It's the subset of capital G, so it's all elements of capital G, such that the element is in H1 and the element is in H2. So it must be an element of both H1 and H2 in order to be put in the intersection of H1 and H2. Okay, so this is a nice subset of our group capital G. What we now want to prove then, the theorem of this video, is that this intersection of these two subgroups is actually a subgroup. Okay, so this subset at the moment is going to actually obey the axioms to be a subgroup with the inherited composition law on it that it will get from the larger group capital G. Okay, so to show this then, we just need to make sure that it obeys the axioms of group theory. We need to go through the axioms of group theory and make sure that this subset of the group capital G is going to obey those axioms with the inherited composition law that it gets from the larger group capital G. Okay, now we know that there is no need to check the second axiom of group theory, associativity. Okay, because we know uh, that whatever subset you take of this group capital G and put this inherited composition law on it, as it will always obey associativity. Whether it's a subgroup or not, it will always have associativity obeyed. Because if the inherited composition law didn't obey associativity, then it wouldn't obey associativity when it was in the larger uh, composition law on the entire group. Okay, so since this is a group, the inherited composition law must obey associativity. So we don't need to worry about axiom number two of group theory. But we do need to worry about axiom number one, three, and four. Okay, now three, we've already discussed that the identity is going to be in here, uh, but we'll write it out formally anyway. Okay, so axiom number one then, firstly. Okay, so what we want to prove then is that if we have two arbitrary elements uh, within the intersection of H1 and H2, okay, uh, that if we compose them together, we'll have another element within the intersection of H1 and H2. Okay, so we want to prove that the intersection of these two subgroups is actually closed under composition. Okay, so let's say that we have, and I should put for all, 
little g and let's say little g bar. So these are just two elements within the intersection of h1 with h2. Okay, so for all little g and little g bar are elements of h1 intersect h2. So you pick two arbitrary elements from at the intersection of h1 with h2, from this subset in green here. Okay, it must be the case. What we need to show, okay, so to show uh, that if you compose those two together, so g composed with g bar, that this is also an element of the intersection of h1 with h2. Okay, so we must make sure that um, it's closed under composition. The answer to what two elements of this subset composed together is equal to is whatever it is, an element of the uh, s subset itself, h1 intersect h2. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, let's just apply the very definition of what it means to be within the intersection of h1 and h2. Okay, so if g, g composed with g bar is going to be an element of h1 intersect h2, then that must mean, by the very definition, that it's in both capital H1 and capital H2. So this is utterly equivalent to saying that G, G bar must be an element of H1 and G, G bar must be an element of capital H2. And I shouldn't put plus for and because in maths it means something different, obviously. Okay, but never mind. Okay, so and uh, it must be an element of capital H2. Okay, so that is uh, the utterly equivalent statement. So we need to show that the composition of G with G bar must be in both H1 and H2. But there's nothing to show there because capital H1 is a subgroup, so it must be closed under composition. And G and G bar must be elements of capital H1 because the initial assumption was that G and G bar were elements of H1 intersect H2. And this means that G and G bar are both elements of capital H1 and they're both elements of capital H2, and we'll use that second fact in a moment. Okay, uh, but the first fact here tells us that G and G bar have to be within capital H1. Okay, so that means that because capital H1 is a subgroup, uh, when we compose those two things together, uh, that, that must still be an element in capital H1, because H1 has to be closed under composition. Similarly, the way that we can prove the second line here, uh, which is that G composed with G bar has to be an element of capital H2 is again just using this fact over here and the fact that capital H2 2 is a subgroup. Okay, so G and G bar are elements of capital H2. It's a subgroup, so when we compose the two elements of the subgroup together, we must get another element of the subgroup. Okay, so that means that G composed with G bar must be another element of capital H2. Okay, and indeed, we have now therefore shown that G composed with G bar must be an element of H1 intersect H2 if G and G bar are elements of H1 intersect H2. Okay, so that's axiom number one then of group theory satisfied. Axiom number three says that the identity element of our group capital G must be an element of H1 intersect H2. Well, that's trivially obvious because the identity is in capital H1 and the identity is in capital H2. Okay, so therefore it's going to be in the intersection of those two, and therefore it's going to be in H1 intersect H2. Okay, so we can tick that one off. Okay, and finally, the fourth axiom of group theory, what we want to show now is that for all, and I keep missing out the for all signs, for all little g is an element of H1 intersect H2. So you pick whatever element you like that is within the intersection of H1 and H2. I need to show that G inverse is also going to be an element of H1 intersect H2. So what I know is that G inverse will be another element of the group, capital G, but I need to show that G inverse is specifically within this subset of the group, which is H1 intersect H2. Okay, so to show that G inverse is in H1 intersect H2. So how am I going to do that? Well, again, the same technique is going to be used. Okay, showing this is utterly equivalent to showing that G inverse is an element of capital H1 and an element of capital H2. Okay, so we need to show this. But how are we going to show this? Well, we're going to use the fact that capital H1 and capital H2 are both subgroups. Okay, now 
if G is an element of capital H1 intersect capital H2, again that means that G must be an element of capital H1 and G must be an element of capital H2. Now if capital H1 and capital H2 are subgroups, then any element that's within them, its inverse element must also be within them, and that therefore implies that G inverse must be in capital H1 and G inverse must be in capital H2, and then we've just got therefore that G inverse must be an element of capital H1 intersect capital H2. So really, this is a very easy exercise uh, to show that two subgroups, capital H1 and capital H2, intersect together, so the intersection of those two has to also be a subgroup. Okay, so as I say, this is a fact uh, that is very, very important. It is used in a lot of the more advanced proofs in group theory, and we will be making use of it in future videos in this playlist.